And John Fuang once divided meditators into two types, those who think too much and those who don't think enough. And the purpose of the training is to turn both types into a third type, those who think just right. Think of a John Chan's image of people walking down the road. He sees some people walking off. They're going to fall off the right side of the road, and so he says, turn left. He sees people walking down the road. They're ready to fall off the left side, so he tells them to turn right. The words may be different, but the purpose is the same. So when you listen to instructions for meditation, you have to ask yourself, Am I the type of person who's falling off the right side or the left side? Do I think too much or not, the, not enough? For most of us here in the West, we tend to think too much. Ones who don't think enough find it easy to get settled down, but they don't have to reflect too much on what they're doing, and as a result their concentration doesn't automatically lead to discernment. As John Fung once said, you have to kick them in order to get them to think. For those of us who think too much, we have to learn how to use our thinking to get the mind to settle down. In other words, we have to reflect on what we're doing. As we focus on the breath, what's the best image to hold in mind? Where is the best place to focus? And how do you focus? Some people, when they focus on a spot in the body, tend to tense it up. Can you learn how to stay at that spot and then release the tension at the same time and maintain your focus? And how do you figure out what way of breathing is best and how do you adjust the breath? If you put too much pressure on that breath to adjust it, then no matter how much you adjust it, it's not going to feel good because you can't get that sense of ease through pressure. So you have to learn a light touch again. Just hold in mind the perception, okay, the breath is going to feel good all the way in, all the way out, and see what that does to the way the body actually breathes. In other words, you're playing with perceptions, and you become very self-conscious about playing with perceptions. And that way you begin to notice connections. If you just randomly think this, think that, without being self-conscious about it, you might be able to get the mind to settle down, but then you don't have any knowledge about, well, how did you do it, and how can you do it again? Because it's going to require a lot of observation. On the one hand, your powers of observation are going to get better as you get the mind more still. And then secondly, the needs of the body, the needs of the mind are going to change from day to day, sometimes in a single day from session to session. And you have to learn how to read that and figure out what does the body need now, what does the mind need now. Does the body need good, long, deep breathing? Does it need more gentle breathing? These are things you have to observe. And at what point do you go against the instructions? I found for myself one, one time that with my frequent migraines, one way of getting out of the unhealthy breath cycle that seemed to, seemed to promote those migraines, I had to breathe in, expand the abdomen to the point where it hurt. And only then breathe out. Keep that up for a little while. It was like resetting the body. So you have to use your ingenuity as well. After all, it is your breath. You're sitting here with your body and your mind. So feel free to experiment, but try to be very conscious about what you're doing, very deliberate about what you're doing. So you begin to get a sense of skill in the meditation. This is the kind of concentration that leads naturally to discernment, because there's discernment in the concentration itself. 
the stillness of the mind required that you think about it and observe. And what are you doing? How are you doing it? You're doing it through the aggregates. Remember, the aggregates are activities. When the Buddha defines them, he defines them as verbs. Even form, he says, deforms. Feelings feel, perceptions perceive, fabrications fabricate, consciousness cognizes. These are different activities, and you use them as you get the mind to settle down. So this way you get unfamiliar terms with them. As a famous philosopher once said, the things we know best are the things we do. Now, for the most part, most people do things, say, with their hands, and they know those pretty well. What they do with their mind, though, tends to be pretty obscure. I mean, it's because we function in ignorance that we're creating suffering for ourselves. But if you're deliberate about what you're doing as you settle down, you begin to realize, okay, this is the form of the body. This is the warmth. This is the coolness. This is the energy. This is the solidity. This is the feeling. The feeling may go with the type of breath energy you've got going. But after a while, after a while I begin to realize okay, the feeling is one thing, the breath is something else. And there are the perceptions, the images you hold in mind as you do this. Thought fabrications. The comments that the inner commentator is making. Focusing on this issue, focusing on that, making comments, evaluating. And then just intending to stay, even when you drop the direct of thought and evaluation, you have to maintain an intention. Keep this going. And of course, consciousness, which is the awareness of all these things. So there you are, you've got the five aggregates. And you get to know them because you're using them consciously. And as you become become more consciousness about them. Conscious. As you become more conscious of them as you play with them. That sense of being familiar with them carries over into the rest of your life. For instance, you see the power of perception with the breath. You begin to realize your perceptions have a lot of power in other areas as well. for good or for ill. Well, so why use them for ill? I mean, you have the choice. Perceptions can be pretty pretty arbitrary. You have the right to choose how you perceive something. And we're talking about having a true perception of the situation. There are lots of true perceptions of the situation. Just a simple fact that you're sitting here with your eyes closed, focusing on your breath. How would you describe that differently in different languages? And how would different sciences describe it? How would a biologist talk about it? How would a chemist talk about it? How would a physicist talk about it? How would the Buddha talk about it? They would all have correct perceptions. But they would be correct for different purposes. Remember the Buddha said, they're like mirages. There's a similarity, but also there's a dissimilarity with, between the mirage and the actual reality out there. So choose your perceptions well. Realize that they have their impact. And if you find if you're getting obsessed about some issue, about how you perceive the issue, remind yourself, okay, I have the choice to perceive things in a different way. And maybe my choice of an issue is an unwise choice. We are talking today a little bit about social anxiety, wondering what other people think about you. Well, their thoughts about you are mirages. Your thoughts about their thoughts about you are mirages of mirages. So why deal in uncertainties like that? 
We're not here to impress one another. We're not here to be liked necessarily. We're not here to be disliked, that's for sure. But whether other people like us or don't like us, they have that right to grant us or withhold from us their liking. And as I said, a lot of their perceptions are mirages too. When you think about how arbitrary this all can be, you ask yourself, well, given that I have the choice, why choose perceptions, why choose issues that are driving me crazy? This is where we see one of the benefits of meditation as it spreads out into daily life. You're learning about the workings of your mind. And the workings of the mind don't work only while you're sitting here with your eyes closed. This is how the mind works as it goes through the day. And when you begin to realize the element of choice that you have in your meditation to use your aggregates in a way that creates a good, solid state of mind, well, then use that same freedom of choice in other areas as well. So this is the kind of concentration that gives rise to discernment as you're doing the concentration. But be prepared, be prepared for the fact that there's going to be more demanded of your discernment than just seeing how you do the concentration. You want to take that quality of being reflective and use it to deal with whatever issues come up in the mind, whether they're in concentration or outside of concentration. It's the mind's ability to, to see something, to gain an insight into something, and then turn around and look at itself gaining the insight and how it responds to the insight. That's the direction in which the, the really useful insights go.